we got some a series of questions that uh, have been asked out there, and, and I want to entertain some of those uh, questions. And, and I encourage anybody up here who wants to uh, chime in on this to please do so. Uh, I don't shy away from insults or, or uh, personal attacks, so I'm going to I'm going to say this right up front. Why don't you run your deputies seven days a week? Why not stage different times for patrol? Doesn't matter what your deputies want. Do what is best for the community or the people of the county. Try something different. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. Folks, I haven't felt sorry for myself for many, many years. Now, when it comes to putting three deputies out seven days a week, first off, there's not enough of them. Secondly, it's, it can be dangerous out there. I've been to 14 funerals. Only one of those officers died of natural causes. And if you don't want me as your sheriff, don't vote me in this ne next time. I will protect my people. I will protect you. I would not walk away from you. So, enough said on that one. I get, a little, I get a little irritated over that. I believe never leaving anybody behind. Is there any way for the Sheriff's Office to participate in helping counties to reduce foreclosures and recouping the money uh, by auditing completed foreclosures? And I can't speak for the other states, and, and I encourage the other sheriffs to chime in on this as well. In the state of Oregon, they have put something in place that it has to go through the legal system before they can finalize a uh, foreclosure. What's, what's happened is, Many of you probably know better than I do. These homes have been foreclosed upon, and it was a matter of nobody's done a forensic audit because the, the original document with the signatures has to follow, and if they didn't, they just sold it to one bank, a bank, another bank, another bank, another bank. But in the state of Oregon, they have put roadblock in the way to help in the foreclosures. Does any other sheriff want to chime in on that one? It works. Uh, yeah, I was, I was approached by a group that wanted me to put a moratorium on all foreclosures within the county. Um, first of all, I don't have the staff, the staff or the expertise that in the time that it's going to take to do this. This is a paper trail that has to be thoroughly, thoroughly investigated. But I did go to a couple of real estate brokers and I said, you know, what happens if I do that? What if I just put a blanket moratorium? on foreclosures and I guess at some point somebody can figure out which ones are good and which ones are bad and, and uh, they said well and I talked to, th to three separate ones and they said basically the same thing they said well overnight your property values in your county will be cut in half secondly he's they said the only way you're going to be able to buy and sell property in your county is with cash because banks if they don't have a way to recoup their money if you default on your loan and again, I know that there's probably some very shady loans out there. Rural sheriffs, that, uh, uh, and I'll give a plug here to NCSA. Um, you, you know, I, I'm a member of the California State Sheriff's Association. You know, large groups, some, some departments that are massive, LA County, uh, you know, uh, Riverside County, I mean huge, Sacramento County. Um, I, we have a weekly conference call that I, I rarely make because I just don't have time for it. But I, when I've gotten on there, I, I'll listen to some of these sheriffs, and most of them are from fairly large counties, and they start discussing upcoming assembly bills or senate bills. They've obviously done their homework. They've obviously, they'll, they, you can tell that they've read these things and they've discussed them. Rural sheriffs don't have time. You know, that's why organizations like this, hey, I can call, I can call them up and say, hey, I'm trying to find something out about this, and, and I can do that with the California State Sheriff's Association, too. And uh, it, really important for us, are, uh, for, for the small sheriffs and the small departments. But when it comes to the, to, to the foreclosures, uh, there are companies out there that will provide you with that service, that will follow that paper trail. And in fact, I think last year there was a, a, an individual representing a company out of Texas that that's, was claiming that they were able to not only identify fraudulent loans, but be, they were able to hand the title to the property back to the homeowner, full, free and clear. So it can be done. 
but it, it's tough. It, it's 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 going to be uh, next to impossible for me in my department. You know, let me let me address the scheduling thing. You know, I, I don't have many more than uh, than Sheriff Gilbertson does, and we've tried everything. It's come to I've come to the conclusion that a lot of people don't even know what we do. You know, we'll have people target. I mean, we have a huge marijuana issue in our county. There's no doubt about it. And and I <laughs> and, and and I'll have people that say you're not doing enough. You're not doing enough. You're not doing enough. You're not doing enough. With four guys to handle all my narcotic cases. And then you'll end up with a murder, you'll end up with an attempted murder, you'll end up with a, a, a second or third homicide, and run the jail. The, this, that's why I, I, earlier I mentioned to, to Sheriff Gilbertson that, uh, uh, you know, basically what's happened to him is, is he was given a tough job to do in the beginning, and now he's basically been handled, handed a job that is almost impossible. But we keep trying. I go out and investigate case, cases. We had a fire last week. Myself and the undersheriff did the evacuations, flagged the houses, stayed out there, you know, did for a week or so, did about 16 hour days. Because that's just what we do. I mean, it, we've got to get the job done. So if, if you think that we sit around with our feet up on a desk figuring, you know, when is the next tea time at the local country club, we don't. We are, we're trying to keep our heads above water. Okay. <laughs> How are the sheriff? I hate microphones. How are the sheriffs? Can you hear me? Hello, hello, hello. Can you hear me? <laughs> See, the microphones don't like me either. Well, thanks. How are the sheriffs going to protect the people for Second Amendment violations by judges and courts? I'll jump on that one. And I want everybody else to answer too, if they would. Uh, as long as I'm the sheriff, I'm not going to allow anybody to come in here and take your weapons away from you. I would, I couldn't sleep at night. I could not, I could not sleep comfortably at night, knowing that I took your means away from you to protect you and your family. Nonsense. As long as I'm on the watch. It's not going to happen in my county, and they could put me in prison for doing it. But I'm, I'm not. I'm going to protect you. Please. Anybody else? Gil, as Sir. long as we have guns, they won't put you in prison. Right. Thank you. Bodoc County, either. I'll tell you right now. I. California, <laughs> no, there's 23,000 gun laws in this country, and then there's a Second Amendment. Does that make any sense? Oh. <laughs> you know, um, I think I issue more CCWs per capita than any other county probably in the world. As far as I'm concerned, I want everyone in Modoc County well armed because I'm going to call on them and I'm the charge and they're going to be right behind me. Nobody's coming up to our... Okay, I'd like to ask a question for the U.S. Observer in front of the mic. Ron Lee. Ron, you want to come up? What? <laughs> I probably should ask, what's the question? <laughs> How you doing, everybody? I'm Ron Lee with the U.S. Observer. So now, you know, I was here today. A little analogy. A little analogy came to my mind. And the American people are Israel. And right now, Iran. Iran. It's the federal government. I know how Hello. you feel. It happened to be in Modoc, man. Exactly. <laughs> And, and we, we stand on the precipice where the federal government has the means of nuking our constitutional rights. Yeah. 
just obliterating us completely. Now the sheriffs, I'm sorry, but we've heard the rhetoric before um, of protecting us, of sanctioning the federal government, of trying to kick out the, uh, the smaller agencies. But really, what is that red line? Yeah. What's that line in the sand where we, the people of the United States, can rely on you to initiate us moving forward with protecting the Constitution and the Republic. For me, that's that's kind of a, an easy one. Do process. Do pro <laughs> hello, hello, testing. Do process while it's still working. When they start taking away the due process for you to defend yourself, that's when I'm going to step up to the plate. Others? John? I think uh, I, I just too, I'm going to use two examples of First Amendment. You know, the uh, right now, uh, our freedom of speech and religion and uh, for free association and uh, I don't know, you know, the, the press, we kind of lost the press, but the, the, I think that's where we really have to draw the line on the First Amendment. And I think the uh, one thing I was going to mention for the Second Amendment, do, do you realize why the Second Amendment was enacted, uh, you know, in the Bill of Rights by our founding fathers? Is it because the Second Amendment was enacted in, in essentially not so we can go out and hunt, and, you know, hunt uh, squirrels or groundhogs. It was to protect all the other amendments because, uh, you know, if we don't have guns, we're going to be like other other countries that are oppressed, that are either socialist or communist in nature. So I think the Constitution is where you draw the line, and those those two amendments come to mind. But there are a lot of other amendments. I mentioned them, uh, you know, in my presentation. But, but in essence, uh, uh, you know, our, our rights are being disintegrated before our eyes. And yes, we do have some judges, we have activist judges, we have some dumb decisions being made, we have legislation that's being enacted uh, in total disregard for the Constitution, but we're just about there now. Uh, and uh, I, I, I'll tell you what, I think the, if, uh, the Second Amendment is probably where we're going to have to draw the line. But I think that what we could do here is, uh, you know, stand for law and order, stand for the Constitution, because the Constitution is the key. It's a supreme uh, law of the land. And uh, uh, I don't want to get too political, but we better vote. You better get out and vote, and you better get all your friends to vote. And I heard a, 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 a survey the other day that said like 30% of the Christians vote or something like that. And I said, what? You've got to be kidding me. But if we don't vote and we don't start getting vocal and use that First Amendment and defend that Second Amendment and all the other parts of the Constitution and the, uh, and the Bill of Rights, we're done for as cities, as counties, as nations. And, and that, that's it right there. I would say that the, the line's already been drawn in the sand with our public lands. It, it, it is time, and there's, there are places that are moving forward, that what we do is our local government, California, it's Board of Supervisors here, Board of Commissioners, because what will happen is, is uh, I had dinner with Doyle Shamley, and he says it's a scary thing to do, because what happens is they move forward the federal agents will come behind them and say, if you guys do this, if you do that, if you do this, you're going to lose money, you're going to go to jail, we're going to put people in federal prison. And that's when the sheriff steps in behind him and says, no, you don't. You have no jurisdiction in my county. All right. Technically challenged up here. <laughs> Do you have guidelines for any organizing a community watch? 
Absolutely, and I'm sure all the sheriffs probably have some kind of neighborhood watch guidelines that they can participate in. We'll come out and train the group. Uh, highly, highly encourage, especially given the situation we're in today, if you're not in a neighborhood watch, get in one. You know, there's so many non-confrontational things that you can do. How many of you carry cell phones that got a camera built in? You take a picture of somebody and what do they do? They leave. Three o'clock at night, you call the neighbors because you, you see a car slinking that you know doesn't belong there, and the neighbors start turning porch lights on. What do they do? They leave. What you want is for them to go somewhere else. They do work. It, it, it is effective. Has there been any solid evidence that the Mexican cartel has moved into Josephine County? I'm sure they, yes there is, and I'm sure the other counties can say the same thing. That's not endemic just to Josephine County. What can the sheriff do when the state and federal agencies refuse to follow the laws of, for coordination? I wrote, I wrote a letter to numerous federal entities. I've been in office now five and a half years, and we have yet to sit down and talk coordination. They just ignore me. Well, you know, we had Fred Kelly Grant come here, and he, and he helped us. And now we've got this Veritas group that's willing to step up to the plate. Folks, there is a way to make this happen. We just need to pursue it and not just sit back and do nothing. Um, other sheriffs? One thing we've done, that, I, that uh, and I'm not going to pretend that we've uh, achieved total success, but I think we have, uh, a, we do have uh, some success stories is you don't take no for an answer. You say, that's the law. What don't you understand about the law? And if some bureaucrat at a higher level doesn't go along with the program, for example, let's use the Forest Service as an example. You go to the Department of Agriculture, uh, but what we've been doing is we go to the Attorney General at the state level and the, uh, the, the Justice Department on the federal level and you start zinging these letters in, uh, they don't like that because you're essentially citing specific laws that they, that they potentially are violating, either intentionally or unintentionally. And our experience has shown they usually will at least sit down and they'll engage in that coordination process. Another thing that we do that is highly successful is you've got to engage your local uh, leaders. It's already been mentioned, your commissioners, your board of supervisors, you know, your county council, your... Uh, you know, your other officials, and also the people. You've got to energize the people to make things happen. Siskiyou County, we have organizations like Protect Our Water. We've got organizations like the Siskiyou County Water Users Association, which uses these legal processes to get things done. Another thing is, I mentioned it uh, during my talk, you've got to engage your, your, uh, your, your federal and your state uh, you know, politicians. Every time something happens, we, I call a congressman, I call it my assemblyman, I call the senator. I have their numbers in my phone. Now, you may not have one that cooperates. We do. And every time I call them, I call them every time there's an issue. Yesterday, we had an issue with a, a rancher who's being assailed by the fish and game because she put some sandbags in a creek to allow water flow. And she's got some messed up fish screen that the Fish and Game put in. Well, we got Aaron Ryan back there representing uh, Senator LaMoffa's office. We, she was there. And we engage our, our local officials, and generally these other agencies do not like that kind of exposure. So you gotta scream the loudest and, and just stay after them, and uh, normally they'll roll in line because basically you're using the law to your advantage. And I like Joe Arpaio, we heard him speak the other day, People say, why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? I'm enforcing the law. We're enforcing the law. And this is still a constitutional republic where our public officials are supposed to be following it. And we have a right as sheriffs to demand that. Not for us, but for the people we serve. What will you do if the federal government establishes martial law and tells you to confiscate guns? One, we just, we're not going to let anybody take your guns. Uh, two, martial law. I'm in hopes 
that the community will stand with me. We will. We will. We're good. Okay. And what do you think about the hollow points that the government's been buying in millions of number volume? I have to ask why. You know, one of the things that Obama said, and it kind of took me took me by surprise, was on the uh, television, was that he wants to put all the returning uh, veterans from overseas, uh, from Bosnia, uh, sorry, Iraq and, and uh, Afghanistan, and he wants to put them into the U.S. Forest Service. <laughs> well, that kind of that kind of struck a, a chord with me. Why would he do that? And believe me when I tell you this, there are millions and millions of rounds of different types of bullets that are being purchased by the government. We have ammo too, lots of it. <laughs> you guys ever want to dress up? It, it, it'd be a, a, amazing, uh, you know, that we were uh, just at the Constitutional Sheriff's Conference and, you know, they're talking about all the entities that, that suddenly have SWAT teams from, you know, from the, uh, from the IRS as SWAT teams that just uh, broke down the door in Sacramento to go after some lady who supposedly had uh, failed to pay her school loans back. Unfortunately, she wasn't there. Uh, we have uh, we have the Food and Drug Administration. The FDA is uh, using their SWAT teams to go into natural food stores that are selling uh, whole milk and raw milk. We have SWAT teams uh, for the for NOAA. You know that that are going on to, on the land. We've got uh, SWAT teams, like I said, and uh, even the uh, even the Fed, the bank, has been given the authority of law enforcement. Now, the Fed is not even a governmental entity. It doesn't have law enforcement authority. In fact, the federal government has very limited law enforcement authority. Jurisdictionally. That's why it's important that not only the states reassert their jurisdiction, but that sheriffs reassure their authority and jurisdiction. Because what is being done in the name of, of, of the people has nothing to do with the Constitution or the law of the land. You know, I had a, one of my uh, staff went to an to a, uh, emergency management uh, meeting with FEMA down in... Uh, in San Francisco, and they were talking about what is the, the, the plan that they have for the North Coast, Mendocino, Humboldt, Del Norte County, if we have a, there's a, a fault line that runs right off our coast. And what is their plan? What is, what is the federal plan going to be for Humboldt, Del Norte, and Mendocino County when this fault line goes? Because it's not an if, it's a, it's a when. It will happen. When it happens, what's gonna occur? They project, you know, a thousand so injuries in my county, a hundred and so deaths in my county. Uh, you know, when this happens, what, what are their plans? Well, the FEMA plan was, well, initially, you know, you're going to be kind of on your own for a little while, then they're going to come in, they're going to be able to come in with the resources. But their, their, their plan for Humboldt, Del Norte, and Mendocino County was that we were going to move your population out of your county. We were going to put them into FEMA camps along the I-5 corridor in Shasta counties and and Tehama County and a few other counties. And then that was it. Their plan was not to allow any of the people to move back to the communities that they call home. Their flat fact was that they were gonna shut down Humboldt, Del Norte, and Mendocino County coasts. They were gonna forbid people from moving back in. We told them, like hell you are. I have to question this one too. Why is it from Ontario, Oregon to the Cascades BLM puts some large triangular signs up that says, this is your land? <laughs> um, sorry, I got a little levity out of that one. Yeah. <laughs> okay, since our public schools teach very little on the constitutional issues anymore, uh, could our county sheriffs help or influence them, and how, uh, and, and to us too. Uh, just to let you know, Hillsdale College, and if you, if you Google this, 
They do offer free classes that you can do online at your pace to learn the Constitution. And uh, we've got some folks in here that, that have written constitutional reference material. Uh, I thought I saw him leave earlier. But anyway, uh, yeah, it's something that we can talk to the schools about and see if, if maybe they'll do that. I know in the, in the state of Oregon, it is written in the state constitution that the schools will teach the constitution. So, you know, it's something we can look into, I think. Comments? Yeah, what we've done in our community is, is of course, through, through our, our local organizations, Tea Party primarily, is we brought numerous educators into our community. Um, we brought uh, constitutional scholars into our community to put on seminars on the weekends, uh, go out, sponsor scouts, sponsor you know young uh, young uh, Republicans, sponsor young Democrats, sponsor individuals that that are within your community, the young people in your community, pay for them to go. It's usually about 25 bucks ahead, you know, for these uh, for these lectures that are put on. They're usually eight hours a day, uh, you know. Do that. Get the people in that, that, that know the material, that can educate and inspire people. Uh, because I can tell you what, you know, uh, what we did is uh, we had these classes, and the first class we had, we sold over four thousand dollars in constitutional material just within our community. Four thousand dollars worth of constitutional material, about five bucks a book, went out that went out that day. That's a lot of constitutional information poured out that. Uh, pouring out of that that type of, of, of a uh, material presentation so you know find them get them sponsor them get them to your areas we had wall builders come and a few other uh, organizations come uh, that did an awesome job of, of teaching the Constitution and more more importantly really inspiring the, the community to learn more anybody else I'm going to have John step up here a minute. He, he authored a manual or a book that's used in schools to teach Constitution, and he's doing that here. So, John, if you want to address that real quick. I caught you off guard, I know. Yeah, right I here, Vincent. Hi. Um, I was actually outside about to get in the car. Somebody pulled me back in and said, hey, you need to come back in here. Um, I used to teach uh, Constitution in a private high school in Riverside County, um, oh, they run, yeah. one of the large counties. <laughs> um, and uh, when I moved up here, I uh, kind of carried it along with me. So right now, uh, at Republican headquarters, every uh, Saturday afternoon at one o'clock, which is why I was here a little bit late, I'm sorry, yeah. we have a constitution study group that I run. and. Uh, after we finished today, I brought them all down here. And um, there's a number of them peppered through the audience. It's fun! <laughs> Hi, boy. Uh, so, um, you are all welcome to come. Uh, we first do a little review of uh, the difference between a democracy and a republic. It's not quite as simple as you think. Uh, and then we uh, go over how far we've gone so far, which is up to Article 1 section seven then we continue on from there and we're just going over it section by section clause by clause what does this mean why do you think they put it in there why is this important why does it make it a republic instead of a democracy and that sort of thing and i guarantee you by the end of it you will have read and understood the entire u.s constitution thank you john Brad. Sheriff Poindexter, this one's for you. Apparently the state of California about 25 plus years ago eliminated the office of sheriff from the list of constitutional law. Oh, that's okay, go ahead now. I'm done. Oh, <laughs> well, he left yours off. About 25 plus years ago, apparently California eliminated the office of sheriff from the list of constitutional officer offices. Who is responsible for this? Who is behind this? This is very difficult to read. Is there anything that can be done to restore it? They don't know about it. It's news to me, I don't know. There's other uh, California sheriffs can talk to it, but uh, I, it's absolutely news to me.
what happened in California, we're constitutional officers. It's in the uh, state constitution. It's also in the government code. Uh, but what happened is California is a unique state because there was a, uh, the, the attorney general at the state level uh, has some, uh, some authority over sheriffs, but court decisions have held. You really don't have the authority. The attorney general's role is more a coordinating role according to uh, court decisions in the past. And some people assail the fact of what's the attorney general got to do with you know, directing sheriffs, and really they don't. And quite frankly, uh, to me, the attorney general issues opinions that are advisory in nature, and the sheriffs are uh, autonomous, they're constitutional uh, officers, and they're probably, quite frankly, the most powerful law enforcement officials in the country, and certainly within the state of California, which in California is saying something. <laughs> Dad, Dad, too, Dad. Testing. Dad. Dad. Hello. Yeah, check it out. I've had enough of this one. <laughs> Hello? All right, we're back. Uh, what I wanted to add to that was, you know, I said it before, the sheriff does not, it does not work for the government. We are a part of the government, I agree, but we do not work for the government. We work for you. Right. Now, th this question kind of feeds into that. How do you get involved in it, or how do you get involved in a situation where the sheriff is sold out? You don't reelect him. If the guy's going to close the door and not take care of his job, don't reelect him. This is the most important election probably of all of our lifetime. And if the wrong people get into office, when you stand in front of that mirror, don't be blaming somebody else. You need to stand up. You need to vote. I have to, I have to tell you, just I, I, I've said this, I've told this story before, but I'll tell you, it kind, of, it kind of really irks me, is this voting thing. Voting is a privilege in the United States of America. Yeah. And I'm quickly... I got to tell you, when I was in, uh, and some of you heard this, sorry for repeating it, in Afghanistan, 2004, first democratic elections in Afghanistan, their history, and they're going to vote for a, a president, Karzai was voted in. First time women got to vote. First time women got to vote in Afghanistan. Some people had to travel two days over raging rivers and through deserts to get to polling sites. Guess what the turnout was? No, it was 70% and the Taliban threatened to ch chop anybody's head off who turned up to vote and, they, and it, it, there were instances where rocket fire and mortar fire came into polling stations and there's a story about a line of women who were, who were standing there ready to vote and rocket fire came in. They refused to, to give up their place in line because they were not going to be denied the uh, privilege of voting. And in the United States of America, sometimes we only have less than half the people come out and vote. You've got to mobilize your friends, your family members, your children, and anybody who will listen. Because if we don't vote this time and we don't come out in big numbers, we're going to lose. Over in, over in Afghanistan, Iraq, in these other places, Kosovo. You can tell who voted and who didn't by the blue ink on their finger. You know what? Over in Iraq, for example, let me back up. The United States, we're lucky to get 40% of the people to stand up and, and make a decision at the risk of death. And that's not an exaggeration. About 70% of the people in Iraq stood up and voted. We should be ashamed. I do not recognize BLM forestry, etc., as officers of the law, uh, they, and they are armed agencies. This is really tough to read. Uh, in the state of Oregon, can't, I can't speak for the other states. In the state of Oregon, uh, they were given law enforcement authority by the state of Oregon. 
and it is in Oregon statute. If they are qualified as law enforcement through the DPSST, uh, they are law enforcement. So the only way to change that is to look at your, your representatives up in Salem, at least here in this state, and deal with it. Again, you gotta, you gotta stand up and be heard. Anybody else? Okay, here's one about the possibility of the Department of Agriculture uh, using helicopters to locate and violate the Clean Water Act. Okay, one of the issues I'm having problems with is God made the land, or God made the rain fall, it landed on your property. Uh, how is it somebody else can take your water? And how can the government take from you without paying you for it? It's in the Constitution. So, using helicopters, they're even talking about using drones. Quite frankly, drones can be very effective for a lot of things, but the government's got to be watched very closely so that they don't abuse it. I'll be the first to agree to that. And Trust also them, we don't. I'm sorry? Okay. Uh, we just answered that one too. Does the Oregon Water Resource Department have the right or have the jurisdiction to cancel or cancel water rights? If not, how do we fight it? I can't answer that question. I personally don't know. I can answer that question. They absolutely do not have the right. They never were given the right. They were never given the ability to have the jurisdiction for the right. You want to say that, Mike? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> Gary has already left, but he was here most of this time. And for those of you who don't know, Gary Harrington, he's the one who's been in jail for 20 some days for collecting rainwater in his ponds up in New Falls. And what I can tell you about that is what's going to be coming down in the next few weeks, and you'll hear it on the news media as well, is what our approach to removing certain people from office is. Because you cannot take a right, exchange it for a fee, I mean, exchange it for a privilege and charge a fee. And by the way, voting is a right. Um, privileges are something that you get from government. We have an absolute right to vote because it's our inalienable and neutral right. Yes, right. So, when it comes to water that falls on your land, you guys need to get involved and look at land patent law. It's land treaty yes. law. And that law supersedes all state jurisdiction. Yes. Okay? That's because we, the people of the state, are the ones that allow the federal government to be a fiduciary to give it back to us in the time of secession when we became states in the Union. Okay, I'm going to have to cut you, okay. cut you off. But that's the answer is it's a land right. Thanks, I appreciate that. Have you or are you willing to consider deputizing responsible citizens to back you? Um, my office, we do use volunteers. I've got a 275, which is not near enough, and I do have reserves. Reserves are trained and certified uh, in the state of Oregon. Uh, I'm, sh I'm always looking for volunteers and I'm always looking for people who want to get into the reserve program. It's about a nine month process and it, it can cost a little bit out of your own pocket. Uh, but yeah, uh, we certainly encourage people to step up and help us. The other sheriffs? Anything? Yeah. <laughs> 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 We do the same thing. Uh, in fact, one of the things I wanted to do is get a good, solid reserve pr program going. It costs us about $1,500 to outfit them and put them through the process. And uh, I ran out of $1,500 per pop pretty quick. Uh, we have an auxiliary program. Everybody, whether you're a reserve or whatever, you get sworn in, you take the oath. Um, and, and you go through a background check. And there's some people, I'll tell you what, they, they go, you know, they'll say, God, 30 years ago, I, you know, I bought alcohol for some minors, and, and I said, you just tell me what you did, we'll sit down and talk about it. I believe in second chances, and as long as it's nothing serious, we invite and enjoy uh, all those that are willing to participate. But yeah, there are some hoops we have to jump through. I need to know who's working for me, basically. I just wanted to uh, address this, this water issue. Um, we have to understand that, that recent changes within the last 10 years of, of where the federal government went with water. You know, originally the federal government had authority over all navigable waterways and that was to provide for the ability to have free commerce trade, to be able to use those areas of navigation. 
but they changed that. They changed it through, not through legislation, but through, through their policy to now having control or their, they presume authority over waters of the Americas. And their definition shows that even a, uh, a dry creek or a, a drainage ditch that happens uh, once in a while is considered to have uh, their authority over that, that drainage ditch. And so this power grab that they have taken, this usurpation of our rights, is, is one of the biggest threats that we have as individuals. Because what they're doing, along with a lot of other agencies, state and others, that, that are all pushing towards the same issue, are using their protection of the water. Their protection of the watershed and their authority to try to stop and, and, and cripple our ability to have agriculture and ranching along rivers beds. Right now they're using the coho salmon as, as the soup du jour that's supposed to be the new spotted owl really to try to limit the ability for human habitation, utilization of agriculture, utilization of ranching along rivers. Well, that's, that's exactly why you build your ranch and, your, and your, uh, your farm along rivers is because you need water. Well, they're now taking and, and saying they have the authority over that water, and they absolutely do not. Listen, water is life. Where it exists, humans can exist. Where it doesn't exist, or where they want to disallow us from utilization, they will drive our rural communities out. They want us to leave. They want us to take away our ability to have a living, to be able to exist in these rural areas. They want to shove us back into urban areas where they plan us to live in their planned communities. Water is life, and we must fight and defend that water. Well, it's four o'clock, and all good things come to an end, you guys. I, I sincerely, from all of us, we appreciate you coming. I hope you take something home with you that was beneficial. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to say two things before we get out of here. Number one, I have been to three World's Fairs and a county goat roping, and I have never seen anyone dumber than Nancy Pelosi. And number two, if we don't put someone in the Oval Office that has the balls to gut quarter and draw the Environmental Protection Agency, we've lost it. Well, as they always say, you can't fix stupid, but you can't vote it out of office.